couple of words of thanks. Uh, first of all, uh, thanks uh, to, uh, to uh, Ms. Saunders for her support of the speaker series. For her support of the speaker series. Um, uh, and also to the, um, the Zelikovic Center for Jewish Studies, which has also been uh, co-sponsoring Professor Pearl's visit. I also want to thank uh, Pierre Hamel from the Faculty of Public Affairs for helping um, to organize the um, filming <laughs> of this event. And today, um, a reflection about uh, about the image. Um, so without further ado, uh, Professor Pearl. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank uh, the Department of Communication Studies for inviting me and the Zelkowitz Center for co-sponsoring. I'd like to thank Ira Wagman for arranging this talk. Um, I'd like to say that it's really nice to see a few familiar faces in the audience, including uh, Nora Draper, graduate of Carleton and now PhD student at Annenberg, who happens to coincidentally be in Ottawa at the moment. Uh, it's really nice to be home. I'm from Toronto originally, and I realized that I was home when I turned on the television and saw not one but two different channels showing beachcombers which is a show I haven't thought about in approximately 20 years, but is totally amazing. Um, and the fact that it was on two separate stations is amazing. Uh, and I'd like to say that the work that you're going to hear today emerged out of a research project I co-authored with a graduate student, and it's still in development, but we did recently hear that we are going to be presenting it at the International Communications Association meeting. So you'll be hearing how it evolves if you happen to be there and want to go to it. And if you are going to ICA, I would advise you all to book your hotel rooms now. I just got a panicked email from Barbie Zelizer saying that they're almost all gone. I will not be there because I will hopefully be busy having a baby. But Alex Sastra, the graduate student who co-authored this paper, will be delivering it. So let's talk about sex. See? It just got better, people! More specifically, let's think together about the best way to talk about sex and violence. So what I want to think about here as professors and pedagogues is how, if at all, ought we to teach, talk about, and show controversial images specifically relating to sex and violence. In recent years, there have been a number of high-profile cases of professors using controversial images in displays in their classrooms. Cases which have caused such a stir for their supposed salaciousness that the Times Magazine was prompted to ask, and I quote, with class work like this, who needs play? From explicit instructional films being screened in the sex ed classroom to pornographic materials being shown in sociology courses, pornography has perhaps unsurprisingly dominated these more recent scandals. But the recent outcry in the United Kingdom over schools supposedly omitting the Holocaust from history lessons altogether for fear of offending and unsettling their students shows that concerns with the teaching of controversial images have to do with things other than just the sexually explicit. And as some of you may know, some of these cases fall outside the classroom in particular, as you might have heard about in invited lectures, public performances, and art installations, the most notorious of which recently was the debate around the live sex show at Northwestern University, which was actually the supplemental viewing for a class on human sexuality. Uh, protests in response to the teaching of these materials have been continuous, but varied in their dimension and media outlets that covered these events were part of the debates, as well as parents, politicians, community, and community members, of course. These debates bring to light concerns about freedom of speech, pedagogical value, and community standards, and generate significant questions regarding both ideology and pedagogy. Yet in all instances, the underlying concern seems rooted in the continuing question of societal and educational boundaries and of the quest to determine conclusively how much is too much. So my interest in this topic came out of the question of what is the point of showing these images? Is it pedagogical in the sense of wanting to shock students? Is it pedagogical in the sense of you couldn't possibly understand these sorts of things without seeing the image? Is it pedagogical in the sense of shortchanging the historical and cultural and contextual issues around these images without showing them? Or are there cases where professors simply chose not to show the images? Are these topics teachable without images? And just because you can, should you? So in order to get at these sorts of things, we go beyond the question of standards to, think, to engage directly with the professors invested with teaching with images that might be deemed controversial 
asking them about their own approach to using visual materials in the classroom. So what I really wanted to do was ask professors about their own pedagogical framing and ideas. And this is a bit of a departure from the research that I've done before, but I'm really interested in pedagogy. So I wanted to talk to some of the most thoughtful people that I know, or thoughtful people that I've heard about, to think about how they do these sorts of things. So to what extent do they frame these images to their students? What are their selection criteria? Are students required to view images? And are they presented with a choice? You know, so underlying this research is, do students have the right not to be offended? And what is our responsibility as pedagogues? Because I've noticed, and I don't know if some of you have this similar experience, maybe it's slightly different in Canada, but there's this real sense of kind of niceness and best practice like yes of course you can show things but if it's going to make someone uncomfortable perhaps one ought not to do so and this really dominates students interactions with one another as well this really high was highlighted for me on a class I teach in the visual construction of race and I taught about the ta Danish cartoon controversy and the first time the students encountered these the reaction was sort of like well, you know, probably they just shouldn't have. It wasn't really nice of them to publish it. And then I thought, well, you know, like, you're Americans. You're supposed to care about freedom of speech. And they thought, oh, wait, this is a freedom of speech issue? I thought, okay, there's something going on here. How does that frame the way professors talk about these things? So through these larger framing questions, we're able to analyze the why of professors showing images outside the constraints of debates around free choice and gratuitousness. So we're trying to use the how to get to the why, seeking to understand the stakes for the use of images as essential components of learning, debate, provocation, and knowledge acquisition in the university context. The process of using loaded and potentially controversial images in the classroom setting is a carefully considered one. In approaching this work, we were interested in interrogating these very considerations, asking questions about the kinds of images in a pedagogical context. We focused on three major categories, ethnographic photos and film, pornography and atrocity photos. And for a variety of reasons, the ethnographic film proved to be a much less viable category of analysis that I can get to in the question period if you're interested. Through semi-structured television, telephone and personal interviews with 14 university pedagogues across a variety of fields, we sought to understand why scholars show such images, how the concern around them frames their own pedagogical approach, and to what extent there are similarities between the kinds of issues each category presents. So is there something about atrocity photos that's the same as pedagogical images? Or are they simply controversial for different kinds of reasons? And can we get something useful about the nature of images themselves through these comparisons? At the heart of this investigation lies an even more fundamental set of questions. What work does the image do in the classroom? How do images that are challenging by a range of standards shape how classroom experiences take form? We asked about the pedagogical advantages and disadvantages of showing these images despite or perhaps because of their controversial nature and seek to open up new and pressing questions about what can be learned from a deconstruction of what constitutes shock itself. So through our research, we began to develop new categories across these groupings that showed similarities between display practice, practices of pedagogues working with potentially controversial images. And again, the question of what constitutes controversy is in itself a lively category of debate. So professors were well aware of the possibilities of controversy, but often it didn't pan out that way. So I'm going to be careful to frame these as potentially controversial. We discovered them for most of the scholars in our sample. The point of showing the image was often that the image was beside or at least adjacent to the point. Professors largely used images not to venerate the power of the visual, but to demystify it. Or conversely, because the imagination itself could not do the visual conjuring work and thus an image was needed to ground rather than, as often stipulated by the protesting parties, overwhelm. The idea of images, professors claimed, was often far more provocative than the images themselves. So it was the unpacking of the very discourse of shock and its ethical implications that was of most interest. So the images themselves tended to be not nearly as upsetting or controversial as the ideas that students carried in the classroom about them. So what we found was that because of this, students rarely objected once they actually saw the thing. And controversies didn't occur as often as we imagine. So today, in the time that I have, I'll discuss the various pedagogical approaches scholars use when showing potentially controversial images in the classroom. 
highlighting important similarities across fields, approaches, and categories. And again, this is a really condensed version of a much larger research project, so I'm happy to get into more of it later. Based on our data, a number of key trends were identified. Today I'm going to focus on the first two trends, but I'm happy to answer questions about any of them. So key trends, I know this is a lot of text, but I'll, I'll try to talk you through it. So as I said, the image was not the event. Professors used images to demystify them, finding that the discussions about the images were much more provocative than the images themselves. And the next one shouldn't be surprising. Framing. The images were carefully selected and students were thoughtfully prepared for the experience. So professors never, particularly in these areas, but I would say in most areas where professors use images, I know a number of you work with images, so they're, they're not random. Professors have specific pedagogical goals in mind when they show these specific images. So while there are various different approaches to framing and the extent of framing, and I'll talk about that a little bit, nobody, not a single professor, tried explicitly to shock or surprise the students by showing them the images without an introduction. In fact, many people talked about how shock was precisely not what they wanted to do because that would impede the pedagogical process. Professors didn't experience resistance or disciplining from their institutions. This was a non-issue in, in, in every case, although we understand that there is some self-selection bias involved in that. Anybody who's going to talk to us probably isn't fearing reprisal from their institution the same way, despite the fact that the sample was anonymized. The images were not used to cause crisis. The courses themselves were often unsettling, you know, a course on genocide film, as one of the people that we talked to, is in of itself problematic and unsettling, but the images were not used to heighten this. Uh, they were, they did cause students to reconsider their ideas, but that's sort of what education's about. Reconsiderations did not stem from the images, which were always used only to support larger course trajectories. So again, rather than putting all this attention and stress on the image itself to cause crisis, the attention and stress was used to demystify the images themselves. So I'm just going to run through methodology really quickly. Uh, we in ended up interviewing 14 professors whose teaching practices included the use of pornographic, ethnographic, or atrocity images in the classroom. We identified them through internet searches and syllabi, as well as through existing writing, secondary writing on the topic. Uh, we did not only seek professors who had encountered controversy, although we did get to talk to some professors who had had controversy or pushback of such images. Unfortunately, one of the people we really wanted to talk to, a professor at Wesleyan University who had students actually make pornography as part of a classroom assignment was, was not available to talk to, but we were able to talk to somebody else in the Women's Studies Department at Wesleyan. Um, we did specifically seek professors from a range of disciplinary perspectives, so we got people from across the map, individuals who actively used challenging images in the classroom and were specifically and pedagogically focused around these questions. And our definition of images was purposefully broad, encompassing film, photography, art, performance, and other visual displays. So we got a long list of potential subjects, and we contacted, we contacted them through a standard email form, and we got a very good response rate. So we used a semi-structured interview process with the same script of questions for each subject. Um, some, most of the interviews were done over the phone, although a couple were actually done in, per in person, and they were transcribed and coded for major themes and overlaps to emerge. And the questions themselves asked professors to identify disciplinary commitments, the classes in which they used potent visual material, student and administrative reactions, framing techniques, responses to objections, whether classes were required or optional, small or large, upper or lower level, and information about their institution and student body. We asked them all this stuff and found almost no meaningful demographic differences. So it didn't really matter if it was a public or private institution, which we actually thought would matter a lot. It didn't really matter if it was an upper or lower class. Uh, there were some concerns and, and there were some differences around whether it was required or not required because professors were sensitive to the questions of captive audience. So that framed the nature of whether or not you could choose not to see certain things. But aside from that, yeah, those questions were kind of a bust. Uh, and again, uh, the literature review, I don't want to get into it in too much detail, but there are, of course, rich resources on pornography and atrocity. And the question of the status of these images, questions of iconography, questions of aestheticizing certain kinds of images, and people have written about them thoughtfully 
But few have thought through the issue in terms of questions of pedagogy across image practice. So people think about the use of images in scholarship, but specifically in the classroom, it's a slightly different valence. And while our initial assumption was that most scholars assume the pedagogical mandate overwhelmed the related concerns, so we sort of thought going in people would say, well, you know, people might be uncomfortable, but we have to show these images. You know, it's just fundamental. Our data shows that professors were highly concerned about the use of these kinds of images in the classroom and deploy them thoughtfully, carefully, and incredibly sparingly. While many scholars expressed their sense that images enhance their teaching in necessary ways, they were highly selective in their choices, operating in consonance with larger concerns about atrocity and pornography images, as well as paying attention to the specifics of the classroom context. So it was actually incredibly affirming if you're ever feeling depressed about pedagogy. So it's a really nice project to engage and to talk to people who are just spending so much time thinking so carefully about what they're doing. So let us begin with the images themselves, or more specifically, the shifting of focus from the images to their broader implications. It's here that the most resonant theme emerged despite the intense attention paid by both students and scholars to the use of the images in the classroom, we found that the image was not the event. While tremendously important as a teaching tool, both to reflect events and considerations, and as a way to frame the discussion about the events, the images were used to highlight the very extent to which they were not the point. Even in cases where they were used for formal analysis, such as in films and pornographic, porn studies classes where you're actually <coughs> sitting and deconstructing the camera <coughs> angles, the lighting, you know, so formal analysis of the images, even in those cases, professors repeatedly emphasize that the images serve to relieve rather than heighten students' anxiety and concern about the controversial nature of what they're seeing. The pictures in the end were simply not as shocking as they imagined them to be. And of course, this is partly because of what the images themselves were, and I'll get to that in a second. So the other reason is that none of our subjects use the images without thoughtful framing and careful discussion of the context. It's important to note that framing varied widely across practitioners. So not everybody framed in exactly the same way, of course. I'm sure all of you have different sets of practices as well. Some frame the image with an eye towards the potentially controversial nature. So some of them tried to diffuse things at the outset, while others shied away from precisely that sort of activity, thinking that would that yet again reinforce the mystical or fetishized status of the image and kind of elevate it in the minds of the students. Some focused on the context of the image and its production history and, trad and tradition, both in the case of atrocity and porn. So giving a lot of these more dry and boring details really helped emphasize what literary scholar Carolyn Levine has called the shock of the mundane. You know, it turns out that a lot of things that seem to be really shocking are actually pretty boring. And in her analysis, she's thinking about The Wire and how drug dealers actually are just bureaucrats like everybody else. But I think that it's actually a theoretical framework that can be usefully applied to a lot of contexts. While others invited students to think about the content even before the images themselves were shown. So again, if you ask people to think about these things and then they picture them, the mind is often an incredibly powerful instrument. While professors approached framing the images differently, they all shared a strong commitment to thoughtful introduction and use of their visual materials in the classroom. And the images were always very carefully selected, and I'll talk about selection criteria in a second. So the images were not random examples of a given type. Not all nudity or violence is the same. Two professors of communication studies coming from seemingly opposite perspectives, I pulled specific quotes that I thought would interest the people in the room, expressed similar sentiments about the ways in which students imagine porn to be more offensive than the images are in reality. A tenured professor at a private research university uses porn in a class on freedom of expression to quote, demystify both images and language, which are after all only representations. This professor strives to upset the default representation of pornography for these students, that pornography is degrading of women and disempowers them. She strives to make this picture more complicated before we decide, emphasizing that while not showing an image doesn't look like the easy way, it can be. She feels that showing the image causes students to reconsider their assumptions, and even those who are most concerned about viewing pornography, who were anticipating something very gross, were relieved that it was not so serious. 
In fact, this professor expressed concern that her own framing of the particular class in which the images were viewed contributed to the buildup of the image, triggering, quote, their imagination of what they're going to see, which is a little too creative. For this professor, the idea of the images was more powerful than the image itself proved to be. The power worked against students' ability to participate in a discussion of freedom of expression around pornographic images, creating a pedagogical imperative to show an example of the image to deflate expectations. So this is actually a little counterintuitive, right? We think the pedagogical imperative sort of trumps the controversy, but here she's saying, well, it actually deflates the controversy. The images were significantly less offensive than the students imagined them to be. And by showing an example, the professor enabled a more productive and interesting discussion. Rather than creating controversy and offense, the use of the image in this context enabled a dialogue that was otherwise impeded by the fantasy of the image. The lack of controversy over the image, the lack of events around the image, served to remove a pedagogical barrier. Far from causing offense or even controversy, the use of the image showed definitively the rhetoric around the visuals was far more interesting than the visuals themselves, which was, of course, the point. Another tenured professor of communication studies at a public research university, and if you know, you come out for lunch and bug me enough, I might tell you who these people are, and because we actually didn't promise anonymity in the IRB, <laughs> and it's actually really interesting. Also engaged with the question of potentially disturbing images of both pornography and war. He differed dramatically in approach from the professor above, choosing, quote, not to show any images which are disturbing in terms of either violence or sex and start ins instead to deal with pornography without pictures, which is interesting. This professor feels that the language is just as provocative and even more interesting to deal with. He feels that what's really scary is words and sounds. He claims that a word is worth a thousand pictures and that pictures themselves inhibited discussion. To that end, quote, by avoiding images, you're able to do intellectual work that you couldn't do otherwise, even though pictures even though they want pictures and they want films, the, the thing that's most memorable I find for students is people talking passionately. An assistant professor of German and Holocaust studies echoed the perspective that dialogue can also be more intense than images, no, noting that what we're discussing is actually much worse than what we see. So once again, even though the strategies are really different, the conclusions are pretty similar, that the image is not the event. Now, it should come as no surprise that professors very carefully frame both the images and the viewing experiences for their student. And let me just say that what I pulled there was just a couple of quotes, but that we found overwhelming evidence for that piece. Now I'm going to move to the pedagogical framing piece. And again, I'm just going to be highlighting what folks had to say. Some courses were explicitly devoted to image analysis, in which case much of the framing was done by the syllabus itself, whereas others used images for selected class sessions, which were not always telegraphed explicitly in course material. So obviously the pedagogical concerns would be different for a class where you're seeing genocide films every week as opposed to a class on, say, freedom of expression, where just one week the topic happens to be pornography. These kinds of classes have specific concerns around captive audiences. Uh, the ones where you're not necessarily, you don't know what's coming up in the syllabus necessarily, who may not have known in advance what their assignments entailed, unlike students taking a class that's explicitly in porn or Holocaust studies. In the former case, where you know it's a more generalized course, professors differed in the extent and nature of their preparation of students for the introduction of images, depending on their own pedagogical philosophies and their goals in using the images themselves. So some spent a lot of time framing the images, whereas others felt that that, again, undermined the goal of diffusing the course, but they were always framed in some sense or other. So most professors knew in the, in the case where um, the course, it was clear what the course entailed, professors knew that students knew what was coming up and proceeded accordingly in terms of their concerns about classroom controversy. But it didn't lessen the extent to which they did feel a responsibility <coughs> to frame images. They were just less concerned with students' reactions from the perspective of offense or surprise. So if you're teaching a class on porn studies, you would imagine that students know what they're getting into to a certain extent. And even if they don't, even if they're coming in angry with kind of, you know, flags waving and ready to take you on, they 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 have some sense, they cannot claim that they were surprised by what was coming, or they certainly ought not to be able to claim that. So a professor of art and art history noted about her classes on memory and atrocity that Right from the title, students know what they're signing up for. It's a self-selected group. 
This self-selection is fostered by the professor at the outset because even though, quote, people don't walk into a class on Holocaust film expecting it to be really a breeze, they do right at the beginning from the very first class meeting talk about just how emotional and difficult the course is going to be. So that if you're not up for it, this isn't the right class for you, essentially. So students have the opportunity to opt out from the beginning. She expects and in fact invites them to be, in her words, destabilized as, quote, I think that one of the virtues and disturbing aspects of difficult images that produce difficult knowledge is that they do stabilize a sense of certainty that students have in terms of what they know about the world. I try and prepare them for that sense of destabilization. These somewhat contradictory comments highlight the gap between sex and violence in our society. Even though students may know from the title of the course what the content is going to be, the professor does not expect them to understand the emotional impact of viewing Holocaust film. And let me just say, I'm not going to get into it now, but we did see a significant trend uh, in people's comments, and this might be specific to American society, that somehow violence is okay and sex isn't. And uh, I think that that's actually really timely given debates that are going on in the United States right now about what the implications of the normalization of images of violence might be. So even though students may know from the title of the course what the content is going to be, the professor doesn't expect them to understand the emotional impact of viewing Holocaust film. She feels a responsibility to emphasize the material above and beyond the syllabus in order to create the type of classroom environment most conducive to the kind of class she wishes to run. For her, the ability to view this material requires sophistication, so this is interesting, so that in the lower level undergrad classes, I tend not to show controversial images. So there was a difference between lower level and upper level courses. Students expect that they know what it is to view Holocaust film, but they may be wrong. It is, according to this professor, harder than they think. Her framing, therefore, has to do with underscoring in advance the very serious emotional difficulty of the class, perhaps because students underestimate the intensity of that experience, once again, because violence is something people imagine they know how to deal with. Despite the clear presence of visual material on the syllabus, professors often strategically give students the option to avoid viewing the images in question, precisely in order to mitigate against their doing so. Tricky, tricky professors. As one professor noted about atrocity films, I always say, if anyone feels uncomfortable or, or needs to leave, please feel free to do so. No effect on your grade, blah, blah, blah. It all ends up being sort of gratuitous discourse, because it's never happened that anyone has stood up and walked out weeping or something. This is like an incredibly sensitive take. The professor noted, though, quote, the key in all this is framing it. To show it, you have to set it up and all that stuff. By allowing students the option to leave, the professor diffused the situation and created an environment in which, in which students were comfortable staying. So once again, this is a theme that we saw, that people come in, flags waving, ready to kind of get all angry, and the professor right away is like, yeah, I get it. And everyone's sort of like, um, well, now I'm just going to look silly. So this is actually a strategy that we heard again and again. Part of creating this environment is the careful selection of material. A tenured professor of politics and African genocide, that is, that is the title of the, of the professor, at an elite private university, screens atrocity films in his class, but I don't show the bloodiest pictures. While there are plenty of extreme images, the professor has chosen to have it, quote, sanitized to an extent. I won't show sort of gruesome horror, shocking pictures. Such pictures are, to his mind, unnecessary to his, quote, motivations in teaching the class, which is, quote, to keep at least, in at least a generation of students' public consciousness. Even the more sanitized images work effectively, including, quote, still images of bloody corpses on the ground or short news clips. And they do this work by offering, quote, these visual reminders that something really awful happened. So you could still carefully select through the images that you have and be incredibly effective is, is the message that he's giving. Perhaps due in part to the, quote, almost iconic nature of the images this professor uses, and also because, quote, there's a sort of understanding if you take a class on the Rwanda genocides, you may be exposed to some pretty awful things, certainly, and images can be part of those things. He does not offer elaborate preparation for the viewing experience itself. Rather, quote, I've said this and sometimes I haven't, sorry, I've said this and sometimes I have, and something like, you may find some of these scenes visually disturbing, and I leave it at that. 
It's careful to note, however, that the entire class is a discussion of their images and their content. So it's not really that he's leaving it that. That's in fact what the class is about. So it's not just sort of glossed over. We'll reference it directly, but not in that sort of meta level of why it was here. For this professor, the students had enough knowledge of the prospective content to allow him to avoid managing expectations even though the images themselves still serve to underscore the gruesomeness of the events in a way that could not otherwise be done. So here's a professor who says you have to show it, but it can be a lot of different things. Other professors use their framing techniques as an explicit part of the pedagogical moment. One professor of Jewish studies at a, pu at a public university introduces Holocaust film by quote, oops, sorry about that, by initiating a conversation on whether or not I should be showing these films and whether or not the library should even own these films because they're horrible. She puts the question of using film in the classroom in active discussion, having the students, quote, talk over ethical, historiographic, and other issues that are going to arise. She uses, she, she seeks to teach students to consider not just the content of the film, but their context, using the classroom as an opportunity to teach, quote, students how to read the frame as well as how to read the image. This professor is careful to have, quote, discuss the historical context for the images before I show them in service of preparing students for what they're going to see. This professor frames the experience because, quote, no matter how much you read or talk about an event, it's never commensurate with seeing it visually. So there is some disagreement between the people that we engaged with about the importance of visual images, which, you know, is, of course, useful and interesting. For these professors of atrocity, the production and framing of the images were as much a part of the classroom focus as their content. These academics feel that their subject and its power and import could not fully be understood without the accompanying images. Part of their pedagogical goal was to emphasize the very serious nature of their topic, a goal that could only be achieved by using images themselves. However, the strong and consistent emphasis on the framing and production of the images removes some of the attention from the images themselves, again underscoring the extent to which the content of the image is only one part, and perhaps a small part, of the viewing and pedagogical event. While some of these approaches and concerns may seem unique to the issues of atrocity photos and films, we found a number of overlaps in the, co in the comments with those dealing with pornography. Professors studying pornography expressed similar sentiments about framing and careful image selection. One tenured professor who works on cyber porn explicitly decided to limit the kinds of sex he screens in his class, as, quote, he made the decision that there was no good reason to show penetrating sex. He simply didn't need to do it, so why should he? The value of such images is negligible, while the reaction could overshadow the conversation and pedagogical focus, so it could actually be damaging. In his experience of showing penetration, which he had done in the past, there wasn't any reason to do that. It didn't really add anything. So given that there was no reason to do it and that there was the potential of harm, again, I tried to edit that out. Like some of the professors dealing with atrocity images, the scholar feels that images are vital to the class topic, but that highly graphic material of a certain kind actually detracted from the discussion and understanding of the course content. He felt that porn was not a special case, and he felt his introduction to be the same of, quote, any video to show whether or not it's pornography, and I think that's an important corrective. We actually do this about everything, right? We don't show entire films if we don't need to. We don't have students look at entire books of images if we don't need to. We, we pick what we do for all kinds of reasons. While, quote, it was framed pretty specifically, he, like many of the subjects above, felt that framing is fundamental to any visual experience, but that the exceptionality of the content lay in its visuality rather than its pornography. Quote, there's a very different kind of set of perceptual equipment, a perceptual frame when it comes to visual and auditory and textual material. So for him, the big distinction was not that it was porn, but that it was a movie, basically, or cyber porn in this case. So he's really interested in the specific media of the images that he shows. Another senior scholar in porn studies argued that viewing pornography is a vital component to its analysis because, quote, I don't think we can actually talk about these things without them actually seeing some of the materials. This was particularly true about pornography is, quote, when it comes to pornography, for sure I think that's really important that they look at some of the stuff that has been talked about. You have to look at it. You have to see it. She, like others, uses the viewing process as a topic 
itself for discussion is she would quote, talk through why I think it's interesting that we look at this material and quote, why I want to show that material. She also carefully selects her content, clearly quote, measuring what kind of images I'm going to use because it's a purpose to what I'm going to show. I might use a scene, something that's a very hardcore scene, but I cut it at the point when they move into really explicit. Like other scholars in the study, she expressed the firm conviction that the material itself is less controversial than its perception, noting that, quote, I don't think this is really shocking stuff. And actually, this particular interview was great because the professor talked about how she's like a 50-something mom who shows up in her mom jeans and her kids and then shows these images. And she says, like, for the students, that contrast is actually also really important because it's not what they imagine a really cutting-edge moment to be like. <laughs> And it's all very self-conscious. This self-presentation, this personal costuming is also really self-conscious. Everyone draws lines about what they show, or more accurately, what they feel they ought not to show, or what they need to show. There seems to be a point beyond which the material is gratuitously provocative rather than interestingly pedagogical. For those working with pornography, not showing penetration is a consistent theme. A film scholar who shows porn, quote, ended up editing out the most lascivious pieces of it and would cut it off right before sex. Cut it off sounds incredibly graphic. A senior communicator, uh, so this next quote is amazing because it was actually one of my graduate students who was interviewing this professor. He's a very <laughs> prominent uh, professor of communications and this graduate student kind of like sat still with total poker face listening to the transcripts of this interview is kind of amazing. Um, and I give the interviewer full credit for a poker face here. A senior communications professor argued that, quote, I think shots of a penis going into a pussy where you can see the vaginal area and the clitoris and all that kind of stuff. I don't need to make my point with that. I'm not interested in embarrassing them, although the interviewer may have been a little embarrassed. So my tendency in later years has been to stay away from erect penises and stuff like that. The point here is that there's a very specific point which is filled, fulfilled by a very specific image designed to destabilize the default interpretation of pornography that is degrading of women and disempowers them. As this professor is not teaching an entire course on pornography, but rather uses it in a specific module, students do not necessarily know that they'll be seeing pictures as part of the porn, part of the porn discussion. As part of her project to demystify porn, this professor carefully frames the viewing experience casually by saying it as simply as, I'm going to show some pictures. We're going to go talk about some porn. Of course, next time I'm going to show some pictures. If you think you're going to be uncomfortable, send me a note. Like some of our other subjects, she emphasized that the analysis of porn was conducted like we're having a discussion about ordinary text in class. There's no treating it as different from anything else. Now, while one professor noted that he respects everyone's basis for not wanting to look at certain kinds of things as something more than just a lack of courage or a lack of education or something, that respect manifested in a warning about upcoming images rather than the decision not to show them. So there are different ways of respecting. You could respect someone by saying, you're an adult. You make decisions about what you do want and what not want to see. So you know what's coming up. But also know that you're an adult, and this is part of the course material, and there are consequences. So I'll get into that a little bit more in a minute, the way that professors framed opting out. So this, in turn, raises another set of key issues posed to our interviewees. If after the careful framing and thoughtful introductions and full knowledge of upcoming material, students still voiced objections or concerns, would professors force them to look, insofar as you can force anybody to do anything? Would they require observation as part of course obligations, such that failure to participate would result in incomplete work and according grade penalties, which is obviously the thing that everyone would be most nervous about. To put it another way, if students fail to understand the importance of seeing the material, either to demystify it or to understand its full implications, do they have the course sanctioned option of opting out? So, for many of our subjects, the failure to wish to see the images indicates that the professors themselves have failed to frame the images correctly, to inspire students to push themselves, to ask students to put their own assumptions into consideration. So does that failure on the part of professors give students the leeway to complete the course without accessing its full material? So if I've messed up, do you somehow get off the hook? For courses where the entire syllabus is structured around the viewing of material to which students might object, the answer is easy, of course not. You're taking a course on Rwandan film, you have to see the films. 
or you're not taking the course. And this issue is unlikely to arise in those cases because students knew what they were getting into, ideally, at the outset. But more complicated are the courses in which potentially controversial material is presented sporadically or only once during the duration of a term. So a course on film practices where one week you're seeing pornography or freedom of speech, one week you're seeing pornography and so on and so forth. So most professors in these cases front load the issue. They frame the material. They inform the students of what's to come. And then by and large, they give the students the option to look away, which, and perhaps this is a testament to the skill of the professors in framing the material, they almost never do. And I'm going to talk about some of the cases when they do do in a, in a minute, and then I'll wrap up. Professors have a variety of approaches to how students might navigate their own discomfort with the material. One professor tells students that, quote, I'm totally fine if anyone feels like closing their eyes. Another noted that even though you were really expected to see this stuff, if something is making you feel uncomfortable, you can leave and you can talk to us about it. One, student, one gave students the opportunity to discuss the possibility of opting out well in advance, telling them the week before showing porn that, quote, if this makes you, oh, if this makes you uncomfortable in any way, let me know and we'll work something out. And here you see that this is actually a collaborative kind of solution. It's framed in terms of problem solving. So not you can't look at it, but we'll figure something out. And in both cases, in this particular case, I've had young women contact me in the class and say they were concerned over it. And I offered them the option of sitting in a way when I showed the magazine cover to the class or the pictures that they could not see it. Or they had the option of coming to class late. Or they had the option of looking down. So pretty simple, actually. And in both cases, they were anticipating something very gross. Who, or who knows what they were anticipating? But they were relieved it wasn't so serious. And had the students avoided the class entirely, not only would they have missed valuable discussion, they never would have come against the limits of their own assumptions, which once again is the point. Now, the starting assumption of all professors is that the material they present is an important part of the curriculum. They have specific reasons for bringing potential, potentially controversial images to their classroom. Students who miss out on those classes are missing an important part of the course reading and importantly discussion. Most professors offer students the option to be present but looking away from the material they wish to avoid, an option which seems to work to assuage student concerns about engaging with difficult visual materials. But for some educators, reinforces the very problematic assumptions about the mythical power of the image they were hoping to debunk. Yet despite this paradox, all are respectful of students' rights not to look. How they navigate the practicalities of this approach depends on the configuration of classes and sizes, and so there are different options. Closing your eyes, looking away, sitting next to the screen rather than looking directly at it, or in one case, having students select their own material and viewing it in private, which could certainly go either way. None of our subjects offered students the option of missing class or its related material entirely, though some students might choose to do so at their own cost. As one professor of Holocaust Studies noted, I wouldn't force anyone to watch any film. There's a syllabus, and you have to write papers on every film on it, so it would never tell students that he or she had to watch certain films, but if they choose not to do so, it would affect their grade. Another professor in a similar field used the framing moment as a way to present the choice to students. By preparing students, I allow them the option of opting out. So I never insist that they view something they're not comfortable viewing. But we have a certain contract by signing up for the course and understanding what the course is about, which represents a commitment on their part. Students cannot be forced to see. They can be offered a choice between doing the work or choosing not to and accepting the consequences. So this is just a summary of those questions. Now, this research, at its heart, is an exploration of the nature of pedagogy and the relationship between professors, classroom materials, and student attitudes. And here I'm just going to wrap up. A more thorough examination of the philosophy of university education would complement our findings as well as provide a more applied framework for the use of images in the classroom generally and controversial ones or potentially controversial ones in particular. Now this study focused explicitly on visual images but it could also work in written versions and descriptions of these topics and whether they're framed and so are texts framed in a similar way. I mean people teach pornography texts all the time. So how do we navigate those kinds of framing? It raises a really interesting question again about the mythical status of the image. And what about alternative media? How do professors think about that when they present their material? And how much was the medium itself part of the decision of what to show? So the professor teaches pornography without images, uses text. How does that work? 
So a finer grain set of questions around media uh, might actually be highly instructive. And this research focused on pornography and atrocity, but even those categories could be more finely tuned. One of our respondents noted that same-sex images produce far more discomfort than heterosexual couplings in the pornographic things that he showed. And several of our subjects commented on the boundaries they observed when choosing what images to show. So we could look at these boundaries in depth. We could look at if some kinds of images are more uncomfortable than others. Um, and these categories are broad for the study, but they could be expanded even further to think about other potentially controversial material. For example, religious blasphemy or images that seem to be religiously controversial, which we didn't touch on at all. Um, another thing we need to do is talk to students. You know, did visual exposure change their outlook, make discussion better or worse? Were the images really that bad? And is it about the image at all? Because here we've heard from what the professors imagine students happen to think, and maybe they were right. So learning is fundamentally about reconsidering. The process may be more obvious in classes with culturally loaded images, but ought to be present in every interaction. With such a framework in place, every class could be said to contain potentially offensive material. It's just a question of how effectively it is presented. And here we come to what is in many ways the heart of the matter. In the case of potentially unsettling material, who gets to decide on its educational centrality? Can the right balance be struck between discomfort and dialogue? And most poignantly, is being unsettled a pedagogical value in and of itself? Overwhelmingly, our subjects said yes. Yes, that they, the professors, get to make the thoughtful decision about what students should see. Yes, that with careful, thoughtful framing and discussion, the balance between potentially gratuitous material and highly productive discussion is not only possible, but probable and useful and important. And yes, in many ways, the fundamental point of education is to think critically about one's own assumptions and inclinations, even and perhaps especially to the point of discomfort. To put it another way, students do not have the right not to be offended, in the words of one professor. I think students have the right to be offended you can't require a student not to be offended by something. On the other hand, I do think that as an instructor, if I've not introduced them to something that challenges their core beliefs, I'm probably not doing a great job in teaching. Another stated that, I don't think there's a right to avoid things that bothers them. I think they should be bothered all the time. That's the whole purpose of being educated. I was always hoping to push past their comfort level. I thought that was my role as an educator. Some class sessions will get students more excited than others. We were just talking about this before people came in. Sometimes that excitement will be rooted in discomfort or disgust or outrage. Sometimes the excitement will be rooted in titillation or thrill or surprise. Sometimes, ideally perhaps, that excitement will be born of a new way of thinking about things or acquiring knowledge previously unknown or misunderstood. This is the utopic version. Yes, I learned something or it's simply getting it when it had previously not been gotten. And sometimes the excitement comes from discovering that something isn't as scary or uncomfortable or disgusting or thrilling or titillating or surprising as imagined and still remains a useful source of knowledge and information. Sometimes, it turns out, the best classroom sessions are the ones when the controversy simply is not. And in that lack of controversy lies knowledge previously unknown and understanding newly gained. In the case of pornography holoca and Holocaust images and atrocity images generally, pedagogues often use these representations not to produce thrill but to remove it. And in that removal lies the most powerful lesson and the most exciting of class sessions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, extremely interesting talk. Uh, we have some time, um, about 20 minutes or so, um, to take questions. So, some, some issues or some fundamental aspects of some issues that aren't clear in the sense that, okay, are you talking really, well, you're not because you said you were, but, you know, it, it, it's sort of framed as being about controversial images. But then there's a kind of overlap in some of the quotations and, and, and the language you, you used that sort of, well, 
in the end, is that what's the difference between controversial images and sort of, you know, any set of images? And, you know, even at the end, I mean, you raise the question of sort of, okay, what's the difference between image and, and, and text and so forth? And so I, I want to ask you to see if you can um, uh, you know, develop that uh, at all, uh, or further, rather, and, and, you know, beginning back to your beginning with the question uh, uh, or the issue of sort of the gap between, okay, there's, a, there, there's some kind of public controversy about the, what's going on in these classrooms and so forth, uh, and, um, uh, and then in the light of the kinds of things you found in which basically it becomes the professor's job to, how should I put it, take all the fun out of, uh, you know, looking at images, let's say, all right? That? Uh, sure. Yeah, okay. So uh, I don't want to give the impression that I was saying that there is nothing singular about specific kinds of images, but I think our findings show that what is singular about the images has a lot to do with expectations rather than content. So part of what gets interesting is actually deconstructing both those expectations and those contexts. Because even something like pornography itself, a category notoriously difficult to decide, I think the legal definition of the United States still remains. I know it when I'll see it. All right, of obscenity. So, so clearly, this is a moving target. So when I was gesturing towards the fact that text or other kinds of images might also be offensive. I think what I was trying to get at is the fact that somebody can be offended by anything. So offense in and of itself is not, in fact, the criteria that we ought to use to judge the nature of the images themselves, which in no way removes the possibility that these are, for certain kinds of purposes, singular, if only by the fact that people react to them. So why do more people react to certain kinds of images than others? And that's, in a way, a really interesting area of discussion, but not one that we could get to in, in this talk itself. Um, now. Well, you said you said you, you felt you didn't usually talk to students right. in terms of expectations or right. that the role that that plays. I right. Mean, Absolutely. In talking to profs, where it's it's mainly a question of okay, if you frame it in a certain kind of way that will diminish a, a, a shock or something, because I mean, it's still clear from, from your talk that there is something about visualizing uh, that's, I don't know, you know. I, yeah, I mean, absolutely. Above and beyond, there's a kind of surplus of. of but uh, I think that's precisely the point, that there is a, mysti a mystical or powerful or fetishized status to the image, and that's one of the things that was precisely in question for the professors. So one of the things that they did was to say, well, how do we interrogate that very power itself? So I suppose my short answer would be images themselves are perhaps unique, although we didn't do the research into other forms of media to be able to entirely support that, but based on the fact that there is so much more careful framing and consideration around images than other forms, and that some images are particularly hot button kinds of images. But I think that one of the things that we all ought to take home from that is that this is really socially and contextually rooted as to what is a hot button issue, when and how. I, I don't think, although some people might disagree, that it's necessarily hardwired what we are going to be offended by. So the negotiation there is figuring out what is the context or what is the social conditions where how far is too far. Uh, and then the second piece of it is, I don't know, professors are taking all the fun out of viewing images. I think the point is that discussion ought to be fun. And if you, the, you present images that actually remove the ability for you to have discussion, then it's the wrong kind of fun. Because not all fun is equally appropriate in the classroom. Uh, thank you very much for your talk. <laughs> um, so a couple of questions for you. Um, one, um, I was wondering whether it was a conscious decision on your part in presenting um, your findings to not include some of the images which uh, were being discussed by the professors, um, and whether you think that might in some way add to the publishing of the research as well. So when you go to publish this, will you include the images? Um, another question, uh, I was wondering whether um, professors 
discuss power relations and their students in addition to just talking about how their students might be shocked whether there were also some uh, considerations about what might be irresponsible in terms of their um, their power relation with their students as the professor so uh, yeah just a couple questions for you. so yes it's a very conscious decision not to include images. This is something that I spent a lot of time thinking about it, both in this and other research that I've done on uh, the responsibility of scholars towards their images and thinking very carefully about the fact that scholars themselves are entertained by our images and our own relationship to our images. And, uh, coming from history where every single talk that you give, if you mention any person, you always have to like steal an image from the net and throw it up there with the dates of largely his, but his or her birth and death. I'm sure you've seen talks like this, where that actually isn't the kind of thoughtful use of images that I wanted to get at. So in a way, the series of talks that I'm giving about around that material, this is an experiment. Can I be interesting and entertaining and provoke the kind of discussion that I want without showing these kinds of images? Uh, so, and also, once again, which images would I select and media becomes a a complicated kind of question. So while the talk would probably be more interesting if I were showing some porn, uh, I, I don't know that, that that in the case of this particular theoretical framework, there's actually a pedagogical justification for doing so beyond simply entertaining, which is not irrelevant. I want you guys to think about what I'm doing. I want you to like me. So those are values. But hopefully I can do it without what I don't think in this case is taking very seriously the lessons of the pedagogues with whom I spoke, that in this case there's an intellectual imperative to do so, although in other cases there might be. Uh, and yes, professors very much thought about power relationships, mostly once again in the context of captive audiences. So what are my responsibilities different in a required course as opposed to an optional course? In a course where the title and nature of the class tell students immediately what is going to be available as opposed to a class where this is just one piece of, of a larger whole. And the sensitivity and the question of power relationships there really boil down to this, again, question of a contract. When you know what you're getting into and you've signed up for it, you have an obligation and I have an obligation. When I might be throwing you a curveball or changing the rules, then I also have a a different and greater responsibility in that power relationship to create other possibilities or affordances for this moment. Anyone else with a question or a comment? Sorry, Shanti. I absolutely must. Um, I, I guess a couple of uh, questions building on, I think, some of the questions you've already been asked. I quite enjoyed the talk. Thanks a lot for it. It certainly has got me thinking about my, my own use of images in class in a, in a, in a different sort of way. Um, but to follow up a little bit on Miranda's question around power relations, I'm also thinking about power relations between students mm -hmm. and the differential relationships uh, because of, you know, kind of pre-existing, <laughs> you know, uh, aspects of personality, sexuality, race, gender, and so on, and then how, tho how those would play out. So not just the contractual power dynamics between the faculty and the students, but in fact, a situation where you're producing um, power dynamics among students uh, in the framing, in the showing, uh, and in the discussion afterwards. So just wondering if that came up at all in the, in the discussion. But I'm also wondering about pleasure, because the assumption is the images are bad at some level. They're not necessarily bad to show. They might have pedagogical value, but they're bad, that we're going to be shocked and appalled and there's controversy and we'll be hurt or, or whatever. But at some level, there's all, there, you know, how do we, so did anyone talk about the pleasure that comes from images. And I don't necessarily mean people just getting off on pornographic <laughs> images necessarily. <laughs> but the, 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 you know, so what, what place does pleasure have in the discussion if we're always assuming that we have to control for shock and revulsion and, and, and negative responses? What about positive, uh, positive responses? And then last question, I was just very curious about um, the fact that a lot of the discussion seems to be about, in fact, demystifying the image at the same time that there's also an incredible reification of it simultaneously happening while struggling so hard to demystify as though, as though it needs to be. Like for, and where this struck me was 
I can't imagine why in a critical course on pornography studies why you would refuse to show penetration as a principle because then you're reifying penetration as a particular, you know, and, and in terms of feminist critical <laughs> studies of, of, you know, of sexual power relations and the role of pornography and pornography and so on, that that would seem to be an odd choice, for example, because in fact it's reifying one of the things that presumably you might want to take on as a cultural construct mm -hmm. uh, as potentially problematic. So I also understand why, you know, there's a reason why I don't show any. If I were in, ca in Canada in my uh, class on the regulation of communication, if I were to show some of the art that has been accused to be child pornography to open up a discussion around where the lines lie between what is artistic practice and what is child pornography, I would actually be breaking the laws of Canada in relation to child <laughs> pornography. I would be exhibiting child pornography um, given the breadth of our <laughs> co you know, contemporary uh, definitions of, of child pornography. So anyway. You know this Thank is recorded, you. right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I said I don't do it. If I were to, <laughs> you know, very careful. Of, cor of, of course you do not. <laughs> of course you do not show okay. child pornography in your classroom. <laughs> uh, so the first question was about the power dynamics between students around questions of race and gender. And I'd like to add, most importantly, religion, in fact, because I think that that ended up being the most consistent space in which students felt uncomfortable was around questions of religion. So the underlying tension there is how much does this lead to a kind of naming and shaming in a particular kind of way? You know, do, do professors need to be sensitive around what kinds of students would be more sensitive to certain categories of images than others? And do we have a responsibility to make those students feel comfortable on their own cultural terms or their own frameworks and backgrounds? So what are the creations, affordances, and struggles around power relations between students. And I, in fact, it didn't come up all that much beyond the gendered piece that it was overwhelmingly women as opposed to men who might have expressed discomfort with pornography. And the professors in those cases showed sensitivity around not trying to make those students stand out, which I'm not sure that's one response, but I could imagine a range of responses. And then the other piece was the professor who mentioned that the homosexual couplings or the same-sex couplings created a lot more discomfort than did the heterosexual couplings and that in and of itself marginalized certain students who whose sexual orientation or practices might have been different than the norm and that led to the professor having to engage with a whole other set of issues that he thought about very carefully and specifically but that was a singular example but I think that that's a really good corrective and would be when we revise the material really useful framework with which to examine this because it does create a number of power relationships between students that that ought to be both considered and interrogated. Uh, the second question was about pleasure and I've actually done quite a bit of research around the nature of pleasure and I will say that it does sound like a lot of the framing of this is negative and I think that that's that was an artifact of the way that this was produced. I will say that the pleasure dialogue ends up emerging a lot more in my research around professional audiences. So a lot of both the research on it, so the research on aestheticization of atrocity images in particular, you know, and the and the decontextualizing of atrocity images and the, the pleasure of pornographic viewing, again, not only in the sense of getting off, but in the sense of artistry and beauty, although getting off too, I mean, that's pleasurable in its own way as, as well, um, is something that didn't seem to come up a lot with the student population, I think partly because there, it was done in this very piecemeal way to highlight a larger point. So while students may have been experiencing pleasure from this experience, that it was so specifically not the framework that I think if anything the pleasure would have been itself kind of shameful, which is problematic in its own way. Some of the pornography studies professors have a very different orientation towards this question of pleasure. Some of them put pleasure in the context of the discussion, but once again, I think the, the response there would be, well, the students know what they're getting into, so obviously this is a very different kind of framework or different kind of course, but absolutely, I think pleasure is a huge issue, and also the validation of pleasure and the space for pleasure within this discourse, because it's not necessar that's not necessarily a problem. Pleasure, entertainment are important and useful and can be values as well. Um, and that just, not just in the sense of we are trying to perform for our students, but also in the sense that understanding pleasure as 
a, a theoretical framework. Uh, and then the third piece about reification and demystification. Now here I don't want to speak for my subjects because I think that that's a really fair critique. I think that some of the response would be you have to balance these things out. So um, clearly there is some kind of reification of the moment of penetration if you remove it. And once again, that's going to elevate it to a certain status in students' minds. But I'm, I, I think that's a really fair critique, but I'm not sure. I don't want to speak for the pedagogues as to what oh, they would say. Enough. But I will say that the legal issues question is the thing that we, we kind of got to at the end is actually really salient. So some universities have rules that you have to be 18, for example, to take some of these courses. Because otherwise, it is against the law to see pornography. Uh, in the state of Wisconsin, which has a, um, one of the first porn studies classes, this was a careful consideration. Students can enter university at 17. And it is illegal in the United States to view pornography if you are under 18 years of age. The other piece of it is we recently had a talk at Annenberg by Constance Penley, who is a prominent feminist and porn studies scholar, um, talking about when she was subpoenaed to be a witness, an expert witness, in an obscenity trial. Uh, and she, she ended up being disallowed as an expert witness for a variety of reasons. It's a, it's a really interesting story, but one of the things that she wanted to talk about was how the fact that she showed these images in her classroom recategorized them from obscenity to scholarship. You know, and that, that is part of the criteria. If it appears on a syllabus, then it is a different kind of object. So there's actually an interesting legal framework and a, and a lot of interesting negotiations that happen around those questions as well. Any final questions or? Yeah, sorry, was it one of the other things, right? Is, um, that it has artistic value as one of the other things. So yes. I mean, if it has artistic value, then it's not necessarily a penalty. Uh -huh. no, yeah, exactly. I mean, again, the framework of how these things get negotiated. And in those kinds of classes, once again, playing off between these, these kinds of conversations, uh, pleasure becomes, in fact, precisely the point, you know. And, and the pleasure, once again, I don't, I don't want to, I do want to emphasize this. Learning things, ideally, is, is pleasure. That's why we do this, right? Hopefully. <laughs> Discuss. <laughs> Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank you all for coming, and thank you very much, Shoshana, for a really interesting and stimulating talk. Thank you.